Visiting Alaska is a different experience than living there year-round. For pretty much anywhere, residency is categorically different from a vacation. A lot of people have reported quick trips to the afterlife, but what would it be like to live there? Swedenborg rep reported observing this exchange between newcomers to the afterlife and someone who knew the territory. When we came into this world not long ago, the newcomers replied, we were told that here and in heaven there are administrative positions, ministries, functions, businesses, research in all the academic disciplines, and amazing works of art and creativity. We had believed, however, that after we migrated or were transferred from the physical world into the spiritual world, we would come into eternal rest from our labors. What are jobs if not forms of labor? Did you take eternal rest from your labors to mean never doing anything? The elder asked. Did you believe you would sit or lie down all the time, breathing in pleasures and swallowing joy? The three new arrivals smiled sheepishly and said they had had some such thought. What do joy and pleasure and happiness have in common with doing nothing? The elder continued. When we are doing nothing, our mind does not develop. It collapses in on itself. Rather than bringing us to life, doing nothing is actually deadly for us. We're going to look just a bit more at what does bring us to life in heaven tonight. Stay tuned. back everybody it's time for Swedenborg life again which means it's my favorite time of the week my name is Curtis and I'm going to be the host tonight taking you through the process and today we're going to talk about angels and that sounds like maybe that would be kind of a fuzzy warm subject but we're going to be talking about them and we're going to be giving a definition of angel that some people might uh, feel rubs them like sandpaper you know, we're going to be saying, and this is from Swedenborg, that a, an angel is a person that was once living in this world who, through a lot of hard work and, and spiritual growth, is now this channel for divine love and wisdom. And you get the angelic mindset through that, something that we can all aspire to be. Now, if you don't like that, you can feel free to change the terminology in your head. You know, if you want to call spirits or, or people in the afterlife, we're talking about us and the places that we can go to. Swedenborg calls that angels, uh, people who have got this mindset and are living in the conditions we're about to describe here. All right, so I'm just putting out all the fires, <laughs> and then we should be able to go at this thing and hopefully learn something, and hopefully I'll learn something from you, get your questions in, get your comments, and we'll do it. All right, so... Let's get into it. Let's talk first about the community. So if we're going to talk about a day in the life of an angel, which believe it or not is the title of this show, um, we're going to have to first talk about days right? Do, do angels have days? Is there a day in the afterlife? Like what time is it right now in the afterlife? GMT minus six, minus eight, plus one? What, what is it? You know, is there, isn't there no time and space? How does that whole thing work? So we're going to lead off with a quote from heaven and hell. This is Swedenborg writing about the states of angels that he observed through his spiritual experiences. So we've added uh, some moving pictures to help you kind of absorb the information. But this is what we're talking about when we talk about a day for an angel. Angels are not constantly in the same state as to love, and consequently, they are not in the same state as to wisdom. For all the wisdom they have is from their love and in proportion to it. Sometimes they are in a state of intense love, sometimes in a state of love that is not intense. It decreases gradually from its most to its least intense. When they are in the highest level of love, they are in the light and warmth of their lives or in their greatest clarity and delight. Conversely, when they are in the lowest level, they are in shadow and coolness or in what is dim and unpleasant. From this latter state, they return to the first and so on. The phases follow each other with constant variety. These states follow each other like variations of light and shade, warmth and cold, or like the morning, noon, evening, and night of individual days in our world, varying constantly throughout the year. Not only that, they correspond, morning to the state of their love in clarity, 
noon to the state of their wisdom in clarity, evening to the state of their wisdom in dimness, and night to a state of no love or wisdom. It should be known, though, that there is no correspondence of night with the states of life of people in heaven, but rather a correspondence of the half-light that comes before dawn. The correspondence of night is with people who are in hell. So that is what we're talking about when we're talking about day. Swedenborg says no time and space in the afterlife, but there are states instead of time. So here we have the stuff that we have here, this uh, you know, morning, noon, evening, and night, is dictated by big physical objects moving around, rolling around. That's how we get these variations. They have corresponding states there but their states of mind, that, that it's, it's actually like a lot of stuff that we'll see in the spiritual world. Swedenborg describes what's going on in you dictates how you're seeing the world. And, they, you know, they say that that's how it is here, but it's even to a, a larger extent there that actually the sights you see can be based on that, you know? So that's, that's the days for an angel, that you can be, if your love and your wisdom, your spiritual light and heat are low, it's like a twilight sort of state. Now, I don't know what it's like. Could it be that the person next to you uh, is in midday while you're at night? And is that, do you see night like that? Or do you see midday? I think so. I don't know how it all exactly meshes together, but that's what we have to go on right now. All right. So we set out that that's, that's what a day is. We're not really, we're calling this a day in the life of an angel. Let's an idiom, we mean what's the moment-to-moment life like? I mean, what do you do? If you're an angel, if you're in heaven, you're in the afterlife, what are you doing? So that's what we're going to look at. And like if you had to give a report on what people around here did, you might start with the, the civilization, the communities that we live in. So that's what we're starting at here in this section. All right, so let's first take a look at what forms communities. We're going to look at heaven and hell, number 41, the angels of any given place are not all together in one place, but are separated into larger and smaller communities, depending on differences in the good effects of the love and faith they are engaged in. Angels engaged in similar activities form a single community. There is an infinite variety of good activities in heaven, and each individual angel is, so to speak, his or her own activity. You are your activity. So this is like, we did a show on this a while ago called The Shape of Heaven, and it's a theme in Swedenborg's works that, that the afterlife, heaven is organized like a human body. And like in a human body, you have a liver, right? And the, all the cells in the liver are liver cells. That's, that's why they're together, right? They're all performing the same function there. It's the same thing in heaven. So everybody who's in, doing a certain good, helpful thing that's similar to other people, you're together in a community, and that actually pulls you together, this focus on trying to serve the common good in some way, right? So that's how communities are formed. Now let's take a look, but, but how big are they? You know, in heaven, does everybody live uh, in little villages, or is it all in massive cities? Or what, what are the size of the community? So here is Swedenborg describing that a little bit. There are larger and smaller communities in the heavens. The larger ones consist of tens of thousands of individuals, the smaller of some thousands, and the smallest of hundreds. There are even people who live alone, house by house, so to speak, and family by family. Even though they live apart, they are still arranged in the same pattern as those who live in communities, with the wiser of them in the center and the simpler at the periphery. They are very closely under the Lord's guidance and are the best of angels. So the answer is all of the above, of course. I mean, you, you're talking about an afterlife that has had people funneling into it forever. You know, this is a huge place. It's not going to be like here on earth, you have people living in all kinds of arrangements, but there, there's only one way to do it. So there are cities, there are towns, there are villages, and some people are living solo, the, the mountain men, mountain women of, uh, of heaven, and that actually people who are living solo are often the ones that are really plugged in. But even so, within each, I don't know if you caught that, within each community, there's a substructure with sort of like... Uh, you know, administrative, the wise people at the middle, and it kind of radiates out. So there's a structure to everything, and this is organized by the minds of the angels that are participating. And we're going to get into this a little bit more. So there's distance. So how far apart, though? Right? Do you? Is it? Is there? Are they all clumped together? Or are they all spread out? Like what determines how far one community is from another? Right? And so this is heaven and hell, forty-two where he says, this is a cool, Swedenborg is going to sit around and tell us like the specifics of how far apart communities in the afterlife are. That's what you paid for, man. This, this sort of like 
encyclopedic detail. The distances between angelic communities in the heavens also vary as their activities vary, in general and in detail. This is because the only cause of distance in the spiritual world is the difference of the state of our more inward natures. In the heavens, then, differences in the state of love. When communities are very different, the distance between them is great. When the difference is slight, the distance is slight. Likeness makes for unity. So we have a little diagram here uh, to kind of, there's two major elements in the angelic mind, in our minds as well, as Swedenborg describes, uh, love and wisdom. And so there's no space in the afterlife, like I was saying, that, but there is apparent space, meaning that it's not, you're not a mile away because you walked a mile away, you're a mile away because you're a mile different in the way you think and feel. You know what I'm saying? So you can see here these different communities, as you go to the right, more and more love pushes you to the right, more and more wisdom pushes you north, and so you kind of get your relation to other communities because you're all on the same grid based on the way you're thinking and feeling. So the inside dictates the outside, and that is that is the theme, that, it, that it's the spiritual world, and the spirit is the mind. So the, the, what we would call the mind and the heart, the thoughts and the feelings, that is the spirit. And so... It's a world based on spirit rather than a world based on physics. So the spiritual things, how you think, how you feel, are what dictates your positioning, what dictates the state that you're in, what you're seeing. So this is the basis of things there, right? And it it's, accounts for some of the fantastic nature of, of how the whole thing works, all right? And there's also... Um, the communities are separate, so is that, are there many little isolated heavens? No, nah, man, there's all this communication that Swedenborg talks about. Heaven and Hell 49, which was just before another one that we read, he's talking about angelic communication. All the communities communicate with each other, but not through open interaction. Actually, not many individuals leave their own community to go to another because leaving their community is like leaving themselves or their life and crossing over into another that does not suit them. Rather, they all communicate by the outreach of the auras that emanate from the life of every individual. An aura of life is an aura of affections based in love and faith. This reaches out far and wide into surrounding communities, farther and wider as the affections are deeper and more perfect. Angels possess intelligence and wisdom in proportion to this outreach. The ones who are in the inmost heaven and therefore at the center have an outreach into all of heaven, so that there is a communication of everyone in heaven with each individual, and of each individual with everyone. So, don't freak out, as he says, angels don't necessarily travel a lot. If you like traveling, you can do it. It doesn't mean everybody. He's just talking about in general, you're plugged into your community, you're living there, you're working, but even while you're there with the people, there's this outreach. And we have another diagram kind of illustrating that in our own way. So you see this, uh, there's all these different communities uh, that have this this aura emanating from them. The one in the center, you see the pale yellow, it's there, they're, again, at the center is the, the people who are the most open to God's love and wisdom, and because they're so open, they're blasting out, touching everyone in heaven, and the, the other communities are affecting the ones near to them, which affect the ones near to them, and so on. So as he says, there's a constant communication of everyone with everyone. And so the happiness, in another passage, he says, you can imagine how great heaven's happiness is because everyone there wants to make everyone else happy. So you have everybody piling in to, to make each individual person happy. This is part of why heaven is heaven, right? Another reason it's heaven is you're with what you would call kindred spirits. This is heaven and hell 44 and 46, two places where he talks about uh, this phenomenon of sort of finding your home with the people who, are, who resonate with you just right. First in 44, kindred souls gravitate toward each other spontaneously, as it were. For with each other they feel as though they are with their own family, at home, while with others they feel like foreigners, as though they were abroad. When they are with kindred souls, they enjoy the fullest freedom and find life totally delightful. And then in 46, further, people of similar quality all recognize each other there, just the way people in this world recognize their neighbors and relatives and friends, even though they may never have seen each other before. This happens because the only relationships and kinships and friendships in the other life are spiritual ones and are therefore matters of love and faith. Makes me think of people, if you've read near-death experiences to any extent, you've probably heard of people say, oh, I... 
met these beings of light, and it was, I had already known them. It's like I'd known them, known them since childhood. Swedenborg uses that phrase when he talks about he would meet people there. He felt like he knew them since childhood because there was such a harmony of souls. You know, they, they think the same way, and they feel the same way. It doesn't mean that you love the people in your community more. You know, there's this outreach to everyone. A- any angel would gladly give everything they had to anyone I- in heaven or hell. Angels will do that. But it's with the people you're close to that you can breathe the most deeply and that you all together can work the best to serve the greater whole. All right? So this is part of heaven. So we've got all these communities, and communities are made up of homes. So let's look at what are the homes like in part two. So yeah, I mean, do you have houses there? Does it rain there? Do you need shelter? Uh, there, there are, spoiler alert, and we're going to read about them. Swedenborg actually devotes a pretty good amount of time to describing the specifics of angelic houses. Bear in mind, this is how they were when Swedenborg was doing this 200 years ago, plus, 200 plus. Um, so I'm sure they've changed. You may notice that in our, a lot of our videos, we're showing modern homes. Uh, so the spiritual world moves forward just like we do. But this, some of the principles he's describing here are probably re- relatively timeless. So we're going into this now. Homes are like, and let's look at Heaven and Hell 184 uh, through 186. Whenever I have talked with angels face to face, I have been with them in their houses. So he's traveling to the spiritual world and he's sort of a house guest in the, in the homes of angels. Their houses were just like the houses on earth that we call homes, but more beautiful. They have chambers, suites, and bedrooms in abundance, and courtyards with gardens, flower beds, and lawns all around them. So it's just like, oh yeah, you, you, have a, you got a garden? Yeah, I've got a garden. So this is stuff we would recognize. Where there is some concentration of people, the houses are adjoining, one near another, arranged in the form of a city, with streets and lanes and public squares, just like the ones we see in cities on our earth. I have, I've been allowed to stroll along them and look around wherever I wished, at times entering people's homes. This has happened when I was fully awake with my inner sight open. So it mean, he's meaning this was not a dream I was having. This was a, you know, what we would now call an out-of-body or spiritually transformative experience. This is, I was astral projecting. You know, I wasn't sleeping. I have also been told that not only the palaces and the homes, but all the little things within them and outside them correspond to the deeper qualities that they receive from the Lord. So here, you sort of have your 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 door and your windows and what kind of furniture is like, well, what could I afford? Or uh, I hired an interior decorator, or I don't care what my house looks like. So that it's just, it's based on circumstance and, and means. But there, the details are, like we've been talking about with everything in the spiritual world, are a reflection of the inner details of the heart and the mind. So there's actually, the, the person themselves is reflected in the house. And don't, isn't that what we're sort of trying to get while we're here is a, a home that really feels like it's ours, like it's us. You know, people always want that. So there, it is you. It's really you. And there's a little more detail that Swedenborg goes into uh, here. So we're going to play a little slideshow for you about it. The houses of good spirits and angelic spirits usually have porticos or long entryways, vaulted and sometimes doubled where they walk. The walls of the walkways are formed in many different ways and are graced with flowers and flower garlands woven in an extraordinary manner, not to mention other kinds of decoration that change and replace one another, as noted. These details appear to them in brighter light at one time, in weaker light at another, but always offering profound pleasure. Their houses also turn more beautiful as the spirits grow in perfection. When the houses are undergoing change, something representing a window appears at the side and widens, and the inside grows darker. A piece of starry sky appears, as does a kind of cloud, which is a sign that their houses are changing into even more enchanting ones. That's cool, you know, isn't it? I mean, you're in your house, and there's meaning coursing through everything. Like, you have a window appear in the wall and you know this is because I'm I'm advancing 
You know, I'm, I'm, I'm growing deeper. I'm growing spiritually. And so this is reflected here. And something's going to change in my house. But it's not like, oh, what? It, like, this is going to be a, a revelation into something deeper for me. This is improving as I improve. There's this whole living, like, it's like God is is constantly with you, like opening new things. Here's something to explore. And so that that sounds like an exciting life. It's like, oh, I'm going here doing this, and then, oh, this is happening. I'm, I'm moving forward. And there's this constant growth that, you know, here we, we go through some life stages, but, but there it's a constant trajectory up, that there's always more to learn. The house gets cooler as you get cooler and nicer. This, this is a constant sort of learning, and that it's reflected out in the world around you, because like in dreams, in dreams, you know, everything of your inside is being reflected, and that's really happening in the world of the spirit, because this world of the spirit is the world of the mind, right? All right, so then Swedenborg also talks about, describes these houses as palaces. Sometimes at Heaven and Hell 185, he says, I have seen palaces in heaven that were so splendid as to be beyond description. However, he's going to try to describe it here. Their upper stories shone as though they were made of pure gold, and their lower ones as though they were made of precious gems. Each palace seemed more splendid than the last. It was the same inside. The rooms were graced with such lovely adornments that neither words nor the arts and sciences are adequate to describe them. On the side that faced south there were park lands where everything sparkled in the same way. Here and there the leaves like silver and the fruits like gold, with the flowers in their beds making virtual rainbows with their colors. On the horizon of sight there were other palaces that framed the scene. The architecture of heaven is like this, so that you might call it the very essence of the art. And small wonder, for the art itself does come to us from heaven. So the architecture, what we see here, is actually sort of the offshoot of that, that the source, the essence of it, is in these amazing buildings in heaven. And, the, you know, like a Frank Lord Wright or whoever gets, gets inspired by this stuff moving through, and then we get buildings here. So that the, And that that's how it is with all kinds of, like, not just architecture, but music, writing, all that kind of stuff. The essence of it is up there. So we're going to, you, wherever you are, you're going to live in a very good arts district when you get that, right? So... Heavenly palace, how much does that set you back, right? I mean, let's think about the the, the wish list here. There's lots of rooms in it. Uh, there's an upper story made of gold, he's saying here. Rainbow gardens uh, reflects the inner qualities of your mind. You know how much you want to pay for that. It's in a good neighborhood. Heaven is the neighborhood. You may have heard of it. It's pretty expensive, right? How much is the price? How much does it cost? The answer is here in heaven and hell, 190. The houses angels live in are not constructed as houses in our world are but are given them by the Lord gratis, to each individual according to his or her acceptance of what is good and true. They also change slightly in response to the changes of state of their deeper natures. So, free. The answer is free, and it's given in response to our acceptance of good and truth. It's not like a, a reward, like, oh, you're cool, so I'll give you a better house. God is constantly coming with all of the love and all the wisdom that anybody can handle. And he is, as much as we'll possibly open up to that, he's going to pour into us. And from that, that creates the the house around, right? If you want to learn a little more about it, we did an episode that was called Eight Strange Places in the Afterlife, and there's a segment in that one called Your House, in which we just go into a few other nuances, or download the book Heaven and Hell, read it for yourself. All right, so we're working our way through the building blocks of angels' lives. We know how they live, what arrangement they live in, we know the dwellings that they live in immediately. Now let's talk about sort of the surrounding landscape, you know, what's showing up there in part three. It's pretty common in spiritual experiences, in near-death experiences, to describe nature. People will wake up in a field, or they'll wake up by a stream, or something like that. There, there certainly is, uh, you know, and why wouldn't there be? Because it's that's like the coolest thing about this world is is the surroundings. Uh, so why wouldn't you get that there as well? The most striking thing about the landscape initially is this this inner reflecting the outer. It's going on not just for the houses, but in the the arrangement of communities, but for everything that is seen. So we're going to look at it in sort of two segments. First, let's look at familiar things, but prettier. Uh, this is stuff that we would. It's a. Uh, it's the same category as stuff that we already have here. It's it's jacked up, as they say, but it is 
it is recognizable, right? So start with heaven and hell, 118. In heaven, one can see mountains, hills, rocks, valleys, and plains, just as we can in this world. Angels who are in the good of love live on mountains. Angels in the good of charity on hills, and angels in the good of faith on cliffs. So, again, it's an approximation, not every single person, but if you look at that, in terms of correspondence, it's not that angels who live in love are also kind of say, hey, I like mountains and charity. Oh, I like hills and faith is like, no, I think cliffs are the coolest. This is a correspondence so that the love, the mountains are a symbol of love. So the love in the hearts of all those angels there create, is, is interact, it's like a, it's a, it's a dual mechanism that there's, the love coming from them is the mountain. Do you understand? I don't, but hopefully you do. Same thing with charity. It was just like, a, you know, this is slightly, it's, it's a different shade of it. So it's re- reflected in hills and faith in the cliffs. So, because fa- cliffs, these being rocky cliffs, and faith often is represented by rocks. And these are actually in descending order of, um, uh, of you know, openness, open-mindedness, lovingness. That, that, so, that if we just have faith, that's cool, but you really want to be motivated by love. But then again, it's all, you're all on the same team, right? Because there's this communication of everyone with everyone in heaven as it's described. All right, so then let's talk a little bit about gardens. He talks a lot about gardens, uh, Secrets of Heaven 16, 22. Swedenborg was actually a major gardener himself. You can check out uh, on his biography. There's like a, a big garden that he had in, in uh, his, his house. And so I think probably his spiritual experiences only strengthened his passion for the whole thing. So he was noticing these in particular. To turn now to the magnificent gardens, they are breathtaking. Huge parks containing every kind of tree come into view, so beautiful and so charming that they defy all power of imagination. They are presented to the inhabitants' outward sight in such a living way that not only are they seen, they are also perceived in all their detail much more vividly than anything our physical eyesight discerns on earth. For the most part, souls being introduced to heaven are taken first of all to the paradisal gardens. Angels look at such things with very different eyes, however. It is not the actual gardens that delight an angel, but the things they represent, and so the heavenly and spiritual realities behind them. And we're going to get the chance to practice being an angel, looking like angels do at things. But we're going to we're going to gear up. Uh, with one more piece of information. This is just Swedenborg again describing sort of the things springing into view, not even just the gardens and the plants, but animals too, having this correspondence with the feelings and thoughts and angels. So here's him describing an experience that he had. The angel took me down to a huge green meadow and said, look around. I looked around and saw birds of gorgeous colors. Some were flying, some were sitting on trees, and some were down in the meadow plucking the petals off roses. Among the birds, there were also doves and swans. These things vanished from my sight, and then I saw not far from me flocks of sheep and lambs and of kids and nanny goats. Around the flocks, I saw herds of cattle and calves, as well as camels and mules. In a grove, I saw deer with tall antlers and also unicorns. After I had seen that, the angel said, turn your face to the east. I saw a garden with fruit trees, orange trees, lemon trees, olive trees, grapevines, fig trees, and pomegranate trees, and also shrubs with berries. Then the angel said, now look to the south. I saw crops of various kinds, wheat, millet, barley, and beans. Around them I saw flower beds of roses with beautifully varied colors. In the north, however, I saw woods full of chestnut trees, palms, linden trees, sycamores, and other leafy trees. When I had seen that, the angel said, all the things you saw correspond to different feelings of love felt by the angels who are nearby. The directions, the directions are meaningful. As we talked about on other shows, the the north, south, east, west, remember we are talking before about placement being dependent on your states of love and wisdom. So the fact that Swedenborg looks to the north and sees forests, looks to the south and sees cultivated land, these all mean things as well, all right? But we're not going to get into them right now because we already 
cram too much in your mind, and I want to save what we had before for this little exercise we're going to do now. So, back by popular demand, we're going to do our correspondences segment. It was saying, uh, the last number we read before that video, that angels see these gardens, these kinds of things that are surrounding them, and it delights their spirit, because not just because they're seeing the objects, but they're thinking of the spiritual realities that those objects represent. And as we've said before in the correspondence segment, that was what sight was in, originally intended to be. That Swedenborg says that the earliest people and how we would do it if we were fully in the divine design is we would look at these sites in nature and simultaneously be thinking of the deeper realities they represented. And then that together is truly seeing the thing for what it is. So do you want to try it right now? All right, let's do it. I'm just gonna we're just gonna play a few uh, different videos of of things we've discussed in a row. You remember mountains are a, an image of love and cliffs, an image of faith, and you have animals and birds as images of, of feelings or correspondences of feelings and birds of, of ideas. So as we take it through, and you don't have to get super specific, see what comes to you, but just be looking at it with that mindset that, hey, there is some spiritual reality being shown to me here. This is a portrayal. So you can see both at once, then you're looking with the eyes of an angel. All right, here you go. good way. Thanks for playing. Uh, we said we're going to look first at familiar things, so now we got to look at unfamiliar things, meaning these are things that appear around angels in heaven that we don't see analogous things to on earth, all right? So we'll begin with the generality and secrets of heaven, 1532. He says, amazing sights can be seen by the Lord's light in heaven. So many of them that they could never be listed. These sites consist of one scene after another, representing the Lord and his kingdom, Re- resembling scenes described by the prophets and by John in the book of Revelation. There are other symbolic objects as well. We cannot possibly see them with our physical eyes, but as soon as the Lord opens our inner eyes, the eyes of our spirit, similar sites can immediately present themselves to view. So, these, uh, these amazing representations and scenes appear, and this is not just something that only angels can see, that if we had our spiritual eyes opened, which is what Swedenborg says was the difference between him and us, that he had his spiritual eyes opened by God and that we can get to the same place. We can see these same things while we're here in the body, all right? And then in Secrets of Heaven 16, 23, he's talking about another thing that shows up there that we don't see here. As for rainbows, there is a kind of iridescent heaven, in which the whole atmosphere seems to be made of tiny rainbows, one after another. All colors in the next life gleam so brilliantly that colors in this world cannot be compared to them. There are also colors that have never been seen in the world. What color? What color? What? How? I, I gotta see that. I gotta see that for myself. What is a? How could there possibly be a color that we don't have now? Uh, we did a little video about that rainbow heaven or the the kind of atmospheres check it out. It's on this channel, The Air in Heaven. There are other um, non-normal atmospheres that Swedenborg describes. Also in that episode I was plugging before, Eight Strange Places in the Afterlife, we, we go into much more detail about that rainbow heaven. So don't leave this episode right now, but when you're done... That's what you can watch next if it's not time for bed. Uh, Okay, so there's that stuff, but there's even more. Apocalypse Explained 1200, he says, I have also seen there, meaning in, in the afterlife, composite animals, like those seen by the prophets and described in the Word. So, for example... Uh, Revelation 4, if you've read it, there is a scene in the throne room where there's animals that appear. Composite animals, meaning like a, a lion with wings, a calf with wings, with, uh, however it appears, a bunch of eyes, you know, and then or an eagle with the same kind of configuration. And that this, this is all meaningful. 
and symbolic that eyes and wings have to do with heightened intelligence and understanding. So whatever, I don't know the specifics. He may comment on it. I didn't research it for this show. But the point is, these are also following spiritual law, the reason these kinds of things are there. All right. Um, so, and then finally, he also describes that the sort of the, some of the smaller details, the ornamentation is much different than, than what we have here. So I'll, I'll let him talk about it. In addition to the cities and palaces, I have also on occasion been allowed to see the decorative work there, such as that of stairways and of doors. These decorations are full of movement, as though they were living, and constantly change to reveal new beauty and symmetry. I've been told that such variations can continue in this fashion even forever, with a harmony forever new, and with the very succession of variations forming a harmony as well. I was also told that these were merely some of the least significant things. So believe it or not, they didn't have any stock video of moving uh, details on. So you got to imagine that part yourself. But that's he describes that yeah, the the ornamentation, the 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 metal work, that kind of stuff is moving and changing. It's, it's sort of like Harry Potter, right? If you guys have read that, it's got like the pictures where people are moving inside. That this stuff is is moving and changing, and that this is in, a, in accord with sort of deeper realities. All right. So if you're still with us. Let's get now, we've sort of been describing this stuff around, we said a day in the life of an angel, but we're just talking about all this stuff around them and stuff. What do you actually do in heaven? I'm glad you asked. We're going to reveal it in part four. So... If you think back, way, way back to the intro, remember there were these people and they were talking to this elder, and he was saying that doing something, doing something useful leads to happiness, right? That this is the fuel for the mind. And you will find that there's, there are a few larger themes in Swedenborg than this idea that true happiness comes from serving a greater purpose, and that this is actually the fundamental of angelic life is being of use. So let's get into what that means. Uh, this is first, like uh, in heaven and hell, he's talking about jobs. So yeah, it boils down to jobs, that your your career is what gives you the deepest happiness. Obviously, it's going to be a little different than what we experience here. Let's see how he describes it. There is no way to list all the functions that people have in the heavens or to describe them in detail, though it is possible to say something on the subject in general terms. They are innumer innumerable and vary depending on the roles of the communities as well. Remember, it was said each community is doing a different thing, so there's obviously different jobs in each community. In fact, each community plays a unique role since the communities differ depending on their virtues and therefore on their function. Yeah, what I just said. This is because virtues for everyone in the heavens are virtues in act, meaning they're, it's not just like, oh, I'm nice, it's I do things that are loving, which are functions. Everyone there does something specifically useful, for the Lord's kingdom is a kingdom of uses. And he'll use that phrase, a kingdom of uses. That this is, heaven is essentially a bunch of people working to make everybody happy. That that's what you do, right? So it's sort of like, yeah, it's sort of like here we have this division of labor and these different jobs, which probably is a trigger word for everybody, uh, that you have associations with misery. Uh, is it like that? Is, it, is there still like a job hierarchy and you have bad bosses and stuff? Not quite. Let's see what Swedenborg says about it, Heaven and Health 389. Everything in the heavens is arranged according to the divine design, which is managed, managed everywhere by the oversight of angels, with the wiser ones tending to matters of the common good or use, and the less wise to smaller details, and so on. So basically, the more qualified you are for your job, the more responsibility you get. Just that would be a lot like on earth. These matters are ranked just as uses are ranked in the divine design. This also means that importance is attributed. So here we go. So, but is it so? Is it like oh, some people are are better than others, and it's like a hierarchy and a class thing? This also means that importance is attributed to each role in keeping with the importance of its use. Angels, however, do not claim any importance for themselves, but ascribe it all to the use. And since the use is the good that it serves, and everything good comes from the Lord, they ascribe it all to the Lord. 
This means that if people think about respect for themselves first, and for their use secondarily instead of for the use first, and for themselves secondarily, they cannot hold any office in heaven because they are looking away from the Lord, putting themselves first and their use second. To say use is to mean the Lord as well, since as just noted, use is something good. And when he says use, he means function, uh, me- something that is doing something constructive, constructive action, and good comes from the Lord. This enables us to determine what rankings in the heavens are like, namely that we love, love, value, and respect the functionaries, meaning the people, the way we love, value, and respect the functions that are associated with them, and also that these functionaries are loved, valued, and respected to the extent that they do not attribute their use to themselves, but to the Lord. To that extent, they are wise, and to that extent, they fulfill their uses from good motives. So, uh, corporate culture there is, what's really important is the job that's being done. And the people who are uh, never think, oh, I'm so cool because I have this job, they think, I need to do this job. And they attribute all the, the good to God, because that's where everything is coming from in the first place. And actually, in the United States, where this program is filmed, we're starting to get into a political election cycle. So there's a lot of people with a lot of opinions. And a lot of people are upset about politicians because they think, oh, they're just they're manipulating the system to get power and just doing favors for people. And they're not really serving the people. That doesn't fly in heaven. That there, it's completely about the service. If you're, it says at the end of there, if you're thinking about, oh, I want this promotion because it's going to make me look good, I'm going to get benefits, you, you can't get it. There's got to be, you're looking at that, whatever, the next rank up, whatever you, because, oh, if I was there, think of all the people I can help. I think of like, you know, somebody who's really smart and has figured out this, this amazing system that's going to alleviate all these problems in the world, but they just need some investment or something to start up, or or they need to get promoted to run a division, then they can enact this. You know, the kind of people you'd want in charge of things. You know that feeling of like, you walk into a hospital or something where you just want the people to be super good at their jobs, and that's what the structure of heaven is doing, all right? So, we're talking about jobs, but what what sort of jobs are we talking about? What jobs do they have? Well, I just happened to have right here, it just, I, I looked out on the driveway, it was there. This is a newspaper from heaven, uh, and it's got a, a jobs section here. So I'll just go through what this is. So it's work needed, and I got a highlighter here, so I'll, I'll work with you here. Um, here's some jobs. Individuals to take care of babies who die in infancy. That is That's a function that people have because, you know, as sad as it is, not everybody lives to be that old here, and they go to the next life just as they were here. And the Sweet Morgan says, the people who had especially loved little children in this life take those little babies in and, and give them every possible care they could have as they grow, because you grow in the afterlife too. Teach and lead children while they are growing up. So similar to here, there's teachers, but you just have a lot cooler curriculum. Uh, teach people from various religious backgrounds about heaven and lead them to it. And this is, the way he describes it is everybody comes into the, the thing with a lot, uh, with a different mindset, different religious convictions all across the spectrum. And the people who, and we've all got stuff to learn when we get there, obviously. And the more you learn and accept that, the more you can be led into heaven. There's certain things you got to have straight in your mind before you can even get there. But it's not just like you're going to get thrown into a foreign culture. You know, that there are people who, uh, you know, were from your religion when they're on earth or your belief system who know everything, uh, know kind of how your mind works, and they're assigned to help you make this transition, right? Protect new spirits just arriving from the world from attacks by evil spirits. You know, people wake, so the Swedenborg describes there's this heaven and hell, and everybody in hell is trying to hurt you all the time, hurt everybody all the time, because they're just like maniacs for power, right? So you think, oh yeah, well, as soon as you're waking up, you don't want to be pounced on. You'd think just automatically they couldn't be there, but nothing is, it's not automatic. There are people, you know, just like here, whatever, I can't think of a good analogy, but it's like people keeping, uh, you know, keeping <laughs> debris off the road, right, so you can travel safely. There, there are people doing all these functions, keeping people safe. If you like to protect people, you want to give them that happy first experience, maybe that's for you. Support people who are going through struggles in the lower earth. Now, the lower earth, if you haven't heard of that, Swedenborg describes it, it's a place, it's not hell, 
but it's not very fun to be in. And this, as we are being spiritually sort of distilled, you get there and you got to, we, we get a chance to kick our bad habits, kind of sort of shrug off the, the negativity that we've gotten from this life. You sometimes go through, as we were talking about last episode, the dreams episode, what, what are called shattering experiences. And that can be tough and that this can happen in the lower earth. You got, got to kind of get cleansed of that stuff. So there are there, one job is helping people who are going through that, helping people who are going through crises. Uh, attend to people in hell and keep them from harming each other beyond set limits. Uh, hell is actually, in Swedenborg's worldview, not a big place of punishment. It's actually an arrangement so that people who are obsessed with evil and with harming other people can live in the greatest peace and happiness that they can. The whole structure is to keep them from ripping each other apart, keep them from self-destructing. Hell is actually an effort to give even evil people the best lives they can have. You know, obviously they don't have the freedom or the happiness of people in heaven, but that's just the nature of if you have such antisocial tendencies, you can't function in society. But there are angels all the time there, like I said, Angels would gladly give their happiness to anybody, even in hell. They don't hold a grudge, and they're there making sure that things, that no, no more harm is coming than can minimizing harm. Only harm is happening for some kind of good purpose. So if, if you, you know, people who are, what, whatever, uh, you're going in, parole officers, that kind of stuff, you're trying to help people out, maybe that's for you. Tend to new people who are just awakening from death. Guide newly arrived spirits to others with whom they are compatible. We were talking about that kindred spirits thing before, right? That that doesn't that that happens through guidance from people. So if you if you know if you're like a, a tour guide here or a travel agent, if there if there still are those, uh, protect individuals in the world while they are asleep from evil spirits, man. And if you want that job, you should check out our last show because it talks a lot more about sleep. All right. So those are just some of the jobs. And if you think we just made that up, we didn't. Swedenborg said it. <laughs> Blame him. Here's pause the screen if you want. That's all the references. You can go check it out for yourself. Okay, so even though uh, there's all those jobs and they're all different, everyone's contribution is important. This is Heaven and Hell 392, uh, where he talks about all the different categories of jobs. There are general categories of angels' activities, but each individual has her or his own specific contribution to make. We're all different. We all, there's all, something we can do that nobody else can. That's why we're us. That's our place in this, in the, in the grand human being or, the, or heaven. So we have a specific contribution. This is because every general service is made up of countless elements that are called mediate or subservient or supporting services. Sorry to stop again, but meaning, you know, oh, we, we need to have a function of caring for people's health. Well, there's somebody who is an expert in, you know, uh, caring for people's uh, organ systems. They know how to diagnose disease. There's also got to be somebody at the front desk who's taking people in. There's got to be someone who's giving people Medicaid. You know what I mean? There are different little functions in there. All these are arranged and ranked according to the divine design and taken together, they make up a, and complete an overarching function that is the common good. The common good, serving the common good, believe it or not, if you devote your life to that, that can make you happier than anything else human beings can experience. Then from Last Judgment 12, heaven becomes more perfect as more people enter it. This is because the way it is put together, the structure that governs all its societal patterns and communications, is the most perfect of all. In the most perfect form, more members means a more complete focusing and agreement, therefore a more intimate and wholehearted union. The agreement and union are strengthened by numbers because each new addition comes in as the ideal link between members already present. Each new addition strengthens the fabric and joins others more closely. So it's the opposite of a private club. I, I feel like I like this highlighter. I'm going to keep it for the rest of this segment. Uh, it's the opposite of a private club. It's not that there are people who are in heaven and they're like, okay, if more people come in here, it's going to it's going to ruin the neighborhood. The mindset is the complete opposite of that. It's we want we want people here because the whole thing we're doing that makes us happy is to make them happy, but also. The more people that are there, the better everything gets done. Which, if you think about it, yeah, if you have, uh, you know, people are designing some kind of transportation system. Uh, if you have a couple people working on it, it's going to be okay. But if you have a 
you have a thousand people, it's going to be that much better. Same thing with all systems. Check out our episode that's called um, The Shape of Heaven, I mentioned before. That talks about how just like in the body, when you move your muscles, the more fibers that fire at once, the stronger that action is. Same kind of thing in heaven. All right, then also everything is done from love. As I was saying, this is Heaven and Hell 393. There are so many offices and departments in heaven, so many tasks that there are simply too many to list. So that list we gave before, obviously, it's not comprehensive. There are relatively few in the world. So you think there's a lot to do here? Go watch some show like Dirty Jobs or, or Weird Jobs, those, you know, those shows. Even with everything people do here, there's relatively few in the world. No matter how many people are involved, they are all caught up in a love of their work and tasks out of a love of service. No one out of selfishness or a love of profit. In fact, there is no love of profit for the sake of livelihood, since all the necessities of life are given them gratis. They are housed gratis, they are clothed gratis, and fed gratis. I think that's how you say it. We can see from this that people who have loved themselves in the world more than service have no place in heaven. Oh, man. So, we just got to make sure. It's fine to love yourself. It's fine to love. Love the world means as I explain every episode, love of self means uh, love of your own reputation, love of control, sort of ego concerns. Love of the world is sort of sensory gratifications. It's okay to love that stuff, but don't make it the head, right? Don't make it the most important thing. Make serving the greater good. Make that the head. Then you're going to be square for heaven, all right? So that's important. Also, another job very important job that people engage in, in addition to their jobs. As Swedenborg describes, it could be called the job of marriage. Uh, I don't know if you guys think about uh, marriage as work here or not. There's our lower third. Um, but Swedenborg there describes that it it's a foundational part of heaven. This, this union stabilizes and does things. And here he talks a little bit about why. Why would you need to be married in heaven? What does it do? Heaven and Hell 382 Marriages in the heavens differ from marriages on earth in that earthly marriages are also for the purpose of having children, while this is not the case in the heavens. As Swedenborg put it, you know, like I said in the very beginning, everybody in heaven was once a person, not necessarily on this planet, but in the physical world. In place of the procreation of children, there is the procreation of what is good and true. The reason for this replacement is that their marriage is a marriage of the good and true. As presented above, in this marriage, in this marriage, what is good and true is loved above all, as is their union. So these are what are propagated by the marriages in the heavens. We can see from this that marriages in the heavens are not the same as marriages on earth. In the heavens, there are spiritual weddings that should not be called weddings, but unions of minds, because of the union of the good and the true. On earth, though, there are weddings, because they concern not only the spirit, but the flesh as well. Further, since there are no weddings in the heavens, two spouses there are not called husband and wife, but because of the angelic concept of the union of two minds into one, each spouse is identified by a word that means belonging to each other. So, couple things there, but to me, there's a lot in there, but the most striking thing is that in marriages is, is created goodness and truth. So that might sound, what, what are you talking about? That's abstract and weird, goodness and truth. But Swedenborg over and over is talking about there are two fundamental elements of everything. I remember before we had that chart, it was the other way, love and wisdom, right? That's love and wisdom, good and truth. The, these are the same, this, the two great categories, you know, the love is just like good, and truth is just like wisdom. These are the fundamental properties on which everything rests. So somehow, in heaven, marriage, marriages, couples are producing this rather than physical children. So, so what that means, I wish he would go into more, but but he says it a little bit there. All right. So that's some of what makes life in heaven good. And just imagine it: you are, you know, say you had your dream job. Like, you get to get paid to do what you really love. But not only that, you really feel the impact that you have on people, and you're so, you are in a state of mind where all you want to do is alleviate suffering, make people happy, introduce them into heaven, and that you just can't wait to get to work. That is an awesome feeling. And Swedenborg is saying, that's actually the root of heavenly joy. So, is it all work, though? Is it all work and, and no play? No. There's both, and we're going to talk a little bit about that in the next section. So, 
yeah somebody noted that this looks like i was holding a cigar um yeah man look as you can tell i don't know how to hold one um so part five unwinding um there is the fundamental joy which is usefulness i was just explaining that do you get it right the fundamental joy is this is what i do this is who i am i contribute to the the greater good i grow in knowledge and learning and love around that and i keep getting better at it and the joy is we're making this beautiful existence we're, we're making everyone in heaven in hell on earth as happy as we can we're pushing for that goal the salvation the happiness of everyone we're pushing for that we're giving ourselves to that cause that's the root joy but you can't just work all the time there is recreation there are these ways of kind of resetting refreshing just like even if you love your job here you do need to have a break every once in a while so I'm going to take a break right now. Just, just kidding. All right, so let's take a look at married love number five. So then they asked the angel, what then is heavenly joy? The angel answered briefly, it is the pleasure of doing something that is of use to oneself and to others. And the pleasure in being useful takes its essence from love and its expression from wisdom. So like we said, the pleasure in being useful springing from love through wisdom is the life and soul of all heavenly joys. Angels in heaven enjoy delights associated with stimulate their minds, gladden their spirits, gratify their hearts, and recreate their bodies. But they enjoy these associations, associations after they have performed useful services in their occupations and employments. The life and soul in all these delights and pleasures comes from the useful services they perform. If you take away that life or soul, however, the subsidiary joys gradually become no longer joys, but first matters of indifference, then stupid, and finally dreary and distressing. So essentially, that's pretty wordy, but it's saying that your underlying joy of your life is what I just said, what you can do. And then from that, you have these recreations, you know, the kinds of things that you do for fun to unwind, and that those are part of the larger system, that they are recharging you for this, this greater goal. If you didn't have any purpose in life, and it was just, I want to do something fun, I want to do something fun, I want to do something fun, you would slowly start to run out. And actually, that number in Married Love, he begins that book, um, which if you want to see more about what he says about marriage in heaven, check out that book. But he, he starts it out with uh, the people who come to heaven and they have an idea of what heaven is. It's constant conversation with like great intellectual people. It's m constant eating amazing meals. It's lying around in paradise. And people, instead of them, you know, God saying, you're wrong, that's not how it is, they say, okay, here you go, try it out, and, after, and people get to go do what they think heaven is for, for a while, and after like three or four days, they're like, ah, oh, I hate this, let us out, and they get taught a lesson, which is being told here. Let's look at the next number. Uh, there are more activities uh, that people do there that are described. In heaven, they have food and drink, just as in the world, also dinner parties and festive meals, and in the homes of the leading citizens there, they have tables set with rich, choice, and exquisite foods, which enliven and refresh their spirits. Again, um... Food is not necessary, but it can be a recreation. They also have exhibitions and shows and instruments and vocal musical performances, all in the highest perfection. Such things, too, they regard as joys, but not as happiness. Happiness must be in the joys in order to come from the joys. Happiness in the joys causes the joys to be joys. It enriches them and sustains them so that they do not become common and loathsome. This happiness everyone has from being useful in his occupation. So some people use happiness and joy as a synonym, but there you sort of see happiness versus joy. Ah, the clash of both. Which is going to win? So as, he's, as that particular translation is using it, that happiness is this underlying sense of worth, sense of purpose, sense of community, sense of love that you're getting from what you're doing for the community. Joy are these, oh, I'm going to go, let's go, let's go hear some music, let's go, let's go out to eat, that kind of thing. And that the joys are there and they, they rest on top of it, that you know you have a greater purpose, so this stuff lets you go and, and just get refreshed, right? So that's what it is about that. And here's a little further on why, True Christianity 694 and this is an angel talking to some, either to Swedenborg or some spirits, I'm not sure. Eternal rest, the angel said, is not idleness. Complete inactivity causes first mental and then physical lethargy, inertia, unresponsiveness, and loss of consciousness. These are death, not life. They are far from the eternal life that is enjoyed by the angels of heaven. 
Eternal rest, then, is a form of rest that keeps all those things at bay and makes us alive. What has this effect is something that lifts the mind, and therefore it is some study or work that excites our mind, brings it to life, and gives it to light. This effect is produced by the usefulness that is the foundation, the context, and the purpose of our work. For this reason, the Lord regards the entirety of heaven as a context for usefulness. Each angel is an angel depending on how useful he or she is. So the idea of eternal rest is an eternal state of happy action. You think about just having nothing to do, your mind starts to run away with you, you but if you have something to do, you think about you're doing a project, but you love it, that that's actually the rest. That's eternal rest. Not that you're always doing it, it's interrupted by all kinds of things. As we're trying to communicate here, angels have as varied and complex and rich a life day to day as we do, and more so, but there is sort of that, that is the, the underlying joy that gives us them this sense of peace and happiness that is heaven, right? Heaven. All right, so we talked about heaven. We talked about angels. We talked about that we can be growing into that. So how do we do it? Let's take a look at some travel preparations here in part six. Okay, so yeah, I mean, this is the spiritual world that Swedenborg is describing here. He's claiming that we're all headed there. We're all on the train, some of us closer than others, but we're all going there in, in what amounts to basically no time in, in the scope of eternity. So how, so it's, it's cool to know a bit of the terrain and then think about how do we make that an easy transition. First of all, uh, you know, if you're going to go visit a place or go move to a new place, you need to know as much as you can about it. So we have a couple other things to, to talk about here. First, why, why are there so many normal things? in the afterlife? Like, why are there houses and plants and animals? So why is that all there? Heaven and Hell 464. While our outer or natural memory is still part of us after death, still the merely natural things that are in it are not recreated in the other life, only spiritual things that are connected to the natural ones by correspondence. Still, when they are presented visually, they look just the same as they did in the natural world. This is because everything we see in the heavens looks as it did in the world. Even though in essence, it is not natural, but spiritual, as has been explained in the chapter on representations and appearances in heaven. So maybe that's like, what are you talking about there? Uh, how this stuff, part of the stuff that appears in the spiritual world is from the minds of the people there, and that we pick up stuff from this world and display it there. It's not the same stuff, but it's an, it's an analog, it's a reflection of that stuff. So because that world is made up of people who have had lives here, that's why you get this sort of normalcy. However, we are in for a lot of surprises. Life does change dramatically. We may be making it sound like it's similar, but it changes dramatically, including what's possible, how you see things. Here's Secrets of Heaven, 1769. A spirit came to me not long after he had left his body. This is Swedenborg talking. This I could tell from the fact that he did not yet realize he was in the other life, but believed he was still living in the world. I sensed that he had devoted his time to intellectual pursuits, which I discussed with him, but then, to my amazement, he suddenly soared into the air. I decided he was the type of person whose ambitions had been lofty, since people like this usually rise into the air, or that he thought heaven was at the top of the sky. This kind of person, too, is usually raised aloft in order to learn that heaven is not a pie, but deep within. And I like that, how it's not like you're just told, no, you're wrong. It's like, oh, you think heaven's up there? Go check it out. And tell me what you see, you know? I soon perceived, though, that he had been lifted up to a group of angelic spirits positioned a little out in front and to the right on the first threshold of heaven. He then spoke to me from there, saying that he was seeing sights grander than the human mind could ever conceive. This occurred on the very threshold of the angelic spirit's heaven. What would it be like in their heaven proper or in the heaven of true angels? So that there's, what that's trying to convey is it's, it's amazing. It's fantastic. It's, it's all, it's, it's levels and levels above. There is both a familiarity and a normalcy about it and a con uh, some kind of continuity, but there's also this, like, um, there's this fantastic, amazing stuff. There is a, a next level of life. There is joy, like, there, like you couldn't imagine here. There are possibilities that we can't imagine here, right? So there's both, okay? So how do we prepare ourselves to make that trip? Well, really, it's not a trip because... We are spirits in the body. 
right? And Swedenborg says all distance is based on states, you know, states of mind. So we can actually accumulate the mindset of an angel while we're on the in this world and actually spiritually be an angel. We can ha- our and our actual spirit can be in heaven while we're here. So what we have to do is be here like the angels are there. Right, so we talked. We talked about what's in the life of angels in this episode, and we ended up discussing this mindset, this love of serving the common good, this lack of pride, this will, this desire to help people all over in all different areas. These are the things that make the mindset of an angel. And we can cultivate that, and you know, you know that oh, you're supposed to be nice, but you you don't always think of I want to try to give myself to the common good. How can I serve the common good? You don't think about that necessarily as a goal, but th- that's the heaven mindset. The more we wake up and we're doing whatever we're doing with this sense of, I'm glad that I'm serving the common good. And when we think about our life, rather than what's the trajectory can sort of be, how can I sc- sort of scoop out the perfect life for myself? When instead, it's how can I be the most helpful to the human race? If we are asking ourselves that question, we're already moving toward heaven. And it may be that when we die, it's like, oh, yep, I recognize this. You know, I'm already, I'm already equipped. I already know the language here, right? The language of love. Ah, oh, that's a sweet way to end it, right? I hope you guys enjoyed it. Give it a thumbs up if you did. I mean it, man. Click like because that, as I always say, helps YouTube think our video is good and spread it to others. Subscribe if you really want to help us out because that gets it so that you'll know we have videos and also pushes it out into the community because YouTube says, of all these people are subscribing, they must be talking about something either that's cool or weird enough that people just want to see it unfold. All right, so thanks for your support. Now, get your questions and comments in if you haven't already because we're going to take a look at them right now. All right, a lot of questions today. Thanks, everybody. And we're going to, man, we're going to get to as many as we can and hopefully do some good. If not, hopefully we'll do some neutral instead of some harm. All right, let's do it. Number one, this is from Preliminal. Why did humans have to begin from primitiveness and all the raw difficulty through history? Couldn't it have started modern without having to go through all that suffering? So, Good question. I like I like quest the the spirit of the question because it's like saying why if if you're telling me that there's God and God is so good, why is things set up this way? How is that fair to people? I have a few thoughts on that if you want to hear them. Uh one is that order. Everything goes via order. The, the, the God Swedenborg describes is what he calls the divine design. That's why all of us go through successive stages. Why aren't we just born adults? Because to be who we are, we need a life of experiences and choices along the way to make us who we are. Same thing with the human race. However, I would say that we actually may be suffering more now than than previously. I mean, you think about uh, there, you know, the 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 sort of world we came out of, the the more tribal kind of life. That, according to Swedenborg and according to many other sources, is actually a really great state of life to be in. That people, when when you're back sort of living with nature as, as we began living in tight community, um, you can be profoundly happy there in, in ways that we haven't really been able to remedy here. So there's that. Even coming up through history, you know, the, the plight of peasants in the Middle Ages wasn't actually as bad if you, if you research it as, as you might think. So... Those are a couple of caveats. The The main explanation is that this is real, you know, that this is it's not a simulation, that the choices we make affect everybody, right? So some suffering comes about because we're in this shared space, which is the world, but we're growing just like everything grows. That's, that's the divine design. Those are a few thoughts. Great question. Uh, you know, there could be more said, but I don't know what to say. So that's it. Let's take a look at the next one. This is from Keith. I was wondering, how does the work Jesus Christ did to reorder the spiritual dimensions apply to us? Do we help adjust the heaven-hell equilibrium, and can hell ever get to where it was before Jesus? Those are some great questions. Uh, so this is all according to Swedenborg, Jesus' mission to, to realign things. Um, uh, apply to us, I mean, we're still feeling the aftershocks of that. 
of the Jesus Christ thing, according to Swedenborg, that that the freedom, the the kind of freedom we enjoy in our minds, our ability to be reformed, that we're following the path that He made. You know that He that because He cleaned up heaven and hell, which which affect all of us in the psyche, that that's far out stuff, huh? That is. That is the path we're following. That is why we can think rationally now, why we're not just overwhelmed by negativity and craziness, why we actually have good and bad influences. Um, as far as do we help adjust the equilibrium, I would, because if everybody was following love and we all started going to heaven, yeah, I would imagine the power of heaven would get way, way up there. Um, so certainly everyone who chooses to go that route is tipping the scale a little bit, so making life better for all the people on earth, you know, because heaven goes to the mind. This is sort of like that, um, that, uh, you know, heaven, people in heaven communicate with everyone. All the good that we do, even in the afterlife, trickles down into the world here. And so, the last part, can hell ever get to where it was before Jesus? Um, so, Swedenborg talks about that when Jesus Christ came, uh, hell was was actually overrunning the bottom levels of heaven people were so bad that there was there was not that as he says total damnation stood threatening at the gates um i don't know it doesn't sound like it according to swedenborg's swedenborg's prediction or, or prophecy or whatever we want to call it you know in our episode that we did that's called the spiritual future of the human race that he says that there's this new church coming that's gonna this is going to be a permanent new phase for humanity um it's not going to be like that so i don't think so but anything's possible all right great questions uh let's take a look at the next one jim Swedenborg describes three levels of heaven. Are all three levels filled with angels only? I kind of thought only the highest one had angels, the other two had spirits. Yeah, so if you read Swedenborg, you will see he talks about three heavens and he labels them, he labels the inhabitants differently. I think we've talked about this maybe in a previous episode of the show, <laughs> so go try to find that. But what what I'm saying is that there is a time when he labels um, everybody that's in heaven uh as angels, you know, and so highest heavenly angels, spiritual angels, natural angels. Then, but he does sort of change that vernacular. Or at other times, he's calling good spirits, angelic spirits, and angels. You know, so he he changes the terminology. It's all the same sort of phenomenon. You know, that the lowest level are good people with the first level of their mind opened. The second is good people with the two levels of their mind open. And the third is the, the deepest level and the two outer levels open. So that's what it is. The, the, the terminology, we can we can go either way. So that's that. Let's take a look at another one. These are great questions. Deborah, if I favor night and sleep over day and wakefulness, does that mean I'm internally inwardly hellish? I love life, but I'm happiest when I sleep. No, I don't think so. What If we're internally inwardly hellish, it's because instead of favoring, you know, night over day, it's we favor harming and controlling and killing people over loving and protecting them. You know, a lot of people love the moon. They love the stars. Um, I have trouble getting to sleep, you know, so I spend more time awake in the night. I don't think that makes me a bad person. I don't think it's like that. I think that there are there are good correspondences to everything. You know, loving, there's that twilight state that Swedenborg is talking about, you know, that that is still in heaven. It could also be that loving the night, you know, means that, uh, you know, uh, means that you love helping people who are in a state like that. Or, but if you're talking about happiest when asleep, you know, the dream world is this whole different world or this uh, this sleep experience. The answer is no. I, I don't think, the only thing that makes people hellish is loving evil. If you, you love, if you think something's cool looking, that's fine. I don't think you're you're uh, inwardly hellish. I think you're cool. All right. So let's take a look at our next question. Robin, I wonder if heaven is in the same space as we are now, but on a different vibration level. Swedenborg says that the spiritual world is not. This is almost a direct quote. The spiritual world is not not far far from us at all. Not distance in the least. He says in another place that people picture the spiritual world as like a bird that's flying up high, almost out of sight. But really, the spiritual world is like a bird of paradise, he says, that's so close to us that it's brushing, almost brushing our eye with its feathers, asking to be seen. 
That's how he phrases it. This from a guy who could open the spiritual eyes and see it there all the time. Yeah, different. That some kind of different level, natural to spiritual, it's right here. We're interacting with it all the time. The, the physical world is interacting with it all the time. This correspondence that we were talking about, that's what makes the things here. So there's, it's right here. I think, I think it's right here. That's my answer. Okay, let's take a look at another one. This is from YouTube Lee. What has Swedenborg said about the fallen angels where they will live since there is no death? So um, the death that Swedenborg describes is the uh, living a life, a, a life, a death of selfishness, hatred, materialism, these kinds of things, right? The, that's the hell mindset Swedenborg calls that death. So, the fallen angels, you know, if that's a reference to the Bible, Swedenborg doesn't say that there are angels who are angels originally, never been people who fell down. Um, he says that that is a correspondence. If you look at our episodes that we did on the meaning of Adam and Eve, the creation story, the spiritual struggles of Jesus Christ, this gets into some of his explanation of the Bible and how that's symbolic and that fallen angels are, you know, fallen truths, those kinds of things. Um, you know, if if we fall, you know, like I said before, hell is there if we really, really want it, and it's a space where regardless of the really bad things we've gotten into, it's a space where we cause the least harm to us and others and can have the most happiness that we can. So that's where they'd be. So I hopefully I answered your question. It's hard just from a little text to know what people are asking sometimes, but when I do know, it's not like I give any better answers. Okay, let's take a look at the next one. Stefan, can we change our house in heaven as we can in this life? Thanks. Yeah, let's see. So like, if you didn't like your house. I think, so Swedenborg talks about, he do, I don't know if he ever talks about somebody just changing their house, although he does talk about whole communities uprooting and moving from place to place. So there is that. There's also, as we heard in this thing, that the house changes with us, you know? The house changes with the mind. I don't think it could happen that you would be in a house and like, I don't really like this house, I want a new house. As you grew, it gets, it's it's the perfect place for you. Do you know what I'm saying? So it wouldn't be like, oh man, I got stuck in this kind of house. What I really want is the house that Jim has, you know, that, that there is this perfect interaction and correspondence with the mind and that it is always changing. So the answer is yes, it can change. Um, I don't, whether somebody just leaves a house and goes to another, it could happen. I haven't, I don't think I've heard Swedenborg describe it. it doesn't mean it couldn't happen. So, uh, but you know, if you're getting any kind of picture of like, oh, I'm worried I'm going to be locked into one place. I don't like, that's not how it is. Heaven is not a claustrophobic thing. Everything is cool there. So if you really want to move houses, there's probably some reason for that, and you'd probably be able to. All right, so let's take a look at another one. Let's get to a few more here. Cortland, Curtis. Swedenborg often speaks contrary to the idea of faith alone, yet he states that Martin Luther actually made it to heaven. Can you explain that as well as what heaven he was in? Um, so you can have ideas so Swedenborg talks, he'll say that he saw famous figures, um, uh, but, and, and to sort of give the dish on, on where they ended up. Um, so Martin Luther, this is not Martin Luther King Jr., this is the guy who start you know, the, the Protestant Reformation, those kinds of things, that Martin Luther. So how could somebody who, so Swedenborg says that this idea of faith alone is wrong. You know, we talked in this episode about usefulness um, and how that's the core of everything. It's, it's about love and how you live. It's not just about knowing stuff. So how could somebody who taught that idea still get to heaven? Well, ideas are not that big of a problem. It's really love. If we have mixed up ideas in this world, even if we're spreading them or whatever, if we're doing it from a good motivation, if we're doing it out of love because we think we're helping people, we think it's the right thing to do, that can be corrected. If you if if the mode you're operating from is I I am looking to help people, what I want to do is help people, whatever you believe can easily be changed and taught. The so whatever ideas we have can be corrected. The problem is if you're operating from selfishness or I I want to control, I want to take things, that's harder to change, right? So even if you have messed up ideas, you can change. As far as what heaven he was in, I, I would have to look that up. I don't want to just guess and uh, and not, I mean, as far as like levels, I mean, I know that there are 
there are groupings a lot of the times based on religions in the earth, because that becomes such a big part of the psyche that Christians will hang out around other Christians, you know? Not that there's, like, divisiveness that there is here, so he would, I would think, be in some kind of Christian denomination there, and obviously not everyone sticks with their religion, so I'm going to leave it at that, but thanks very much for the question. Okay, so let's do another one. This is David. Did Swedenborg write of his initial shock and awe he experienced at his first visit to heaven? He describes shock and awe a lot, uh, or being overwhelmed, and yet the, the, to him it became routine. It became routine uh, because he was able to go for continuously for like 30 years. However, um, it was not always like that. He had a first time. Now, and he, uh, let me say that even even after he had been visiting for quite a long time, you'll still see that he'll say like this this angelic thing was completely inexpressible. I was overcome by this. Even throughout his life, he was just this is this is amazing. This is too much. Um, I don't. I'm not sure chronologically of his first trip to heaven. Like the the way that the books are written, you know, heaven and hell, secrets of heaven. It doesn't go in the chronological order of his experience. It's going topic by topic. There is his journal of dreams and his journal of spiritual experiences, which happen in the order that he had them, but he doesn't, like, say, this is when I first went to heaven, and it was so amazing. Um, so it's it's more like, um, he'll say, I, it sort of eases into it. So I, I'm not thinking of a particular passage when he says it, but I want to say that he's... He's amazed all the time. And I'm sure the first time that all these different experiences happened was, it's not like he was like, well, that's cool. He was as mind blown as, that's why it's good to read some near-death experiences, modern experiences, because they really get into how um, how emotional it is. And he'll describe it, but because it's not contemporary, it's, it doesn't always come across as much. All right, it's getting late, so we're going to do one more. Uh, Deborah, I've been married twice, but became a widow. Which husband would I be with? All right. So, and I can I can say this because Swedenborg comments on this directly, um, which is that people, yes, he talks about this idea of, of conjugal love or married love, soulmates, that we might call it on earth, and he says that for everyone there is somebody, and that that's a big part of heavenly happiness as well. Um, but, yeah, what about if you've had multiple partners in this life? Well, he says that actually people someone who's married many different people, in the afterlife, they go and actually hang out for a while with each person that they'd been married to. Um, and in that time, since you're in the spiritual world, you're, you're deeper into your true self, uh, you see better, are we a good fit or not? You know? And so it's, it's like you spend time and it becomes clear, okay, it, it doesn't mean it's not amiable, you know that, that you can you can part ways with someone and still still live in heaven with them, still see them. You even see here people have gotten divorced and remarried and still hang out with each other. You know, um, so there's this uh, there's this process you go through of spending time with each person and seeing who was I actually who did I have this who was I meant to be with who did I have this deeper spiritual connection with and it may be none of them you know it, it may be one of them uh, the, we get led to that person but it's not in it's not until you really realize okay this is the right this is the right place for me to be in right so sweet and swedenborg describes that happening in the afterlife so if you believe him that's how it went down all right everybody sorry to cut it off there we had a few more but we you know everyone's got to go we got we got stuff to do right I, i'm assuming you guys do <laughs> so uh, thanks so much for hanging out if you like this program if you want to help it keep going consider making a donation can be matched five to one with our grants, meaning if you give five bucks, we can get five times that additionally on. Uh, it's tax deductible. Check it out. Or you can become a member, 20 bucks for a year. I say this money stuff because money is the engine that lets us put together content. So if you want to help it out in that way, that's awesome. If it doesn't work right now, no pressure. So hope you had fun. Uh, next week, we're going to be taking a look back uh, we're gonna we, since we had sort of an afterlife theme here. We're gonna be looking deeper into the the life after death in a in a throwback episode where we get into the the bowels of the clips here and and see what we can find. So hope you'll join us for that, and I'll see you then. Bye. <laughs>